Barksdale Hortenstein Jr. is the name of a man I know and respect a lot. He's an attorney and a mental health advocate with the New Orleans Public Defenders. He is on today's show. Also, the great Barry Ritholtz joins me for an almost hour-long conversation about a wide range of financial and economic behavioral issues and more. My name is Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Hey guys, welcome to today's podcast. This is episode 114. I hope that you're hanging in there. I saw today that a third of Americans are reporting that they are struggling with anxiety or depression. And I certainly have many times been doing pretty well lately. My wife's in a little bit of a low or a lot of bit of a low. She told me tonight, just uh, struggling with uncertainty, feeling overwhelmed, having nothing really to look forward to, no plans and not a lot of joy. And we've got our own set of issues with health insurance and with our daughter scoliosis, our older daughter, our younger daughter almost broke her arm Sunday night. You've got your set of problems, I'm sure, as well. And I'm here to hear about them. We're going to keep talking about all of our personal issues as well as the world and national issues that we discuss on a regular basis here on the show. Thanks to all the feedback on yesterday's show, episode 113, with Essie Cup and Steve Hassan. I'll be doing part two with him next week. So definitely stay tuned for that. So much to discuss. It's uh, the... 1224th day, I think. Not that anybody's counting. Or, well, I'm sorry, 1226 of the Trump presidency. There are 159 days until the presidential election. I hope we have it. Matt Kaiser writes at whatthefuckjusthappentoday.com today in one sentence. Coronavirus deaths in the U.S. passed 100,000. Twitter added a fact check label to two of Trump's tweets, and Trump threatened to close Twitter. A conservative organization working to restrict voting in the 2020 election is part of a dark money network that has been helping Trump remake the U.S. federal court system. Trump's press secretary has voted by mail in every Florida election she has participated in since 2010, but insists that mail-in voting is rife with fraud, and the Trump administration no longer regards Hong Kong as autonomous from mainland China. Great job, Matt Kaiser. What the fuck just happened today? Com always put so much in that first sentence you should subscribe to that guy's daily newsletter he also mentioned that uh, dr anthony fauci a lot of news outlets reporting said apparently that on the drug hydroxychloroquine guess what guys it's not an effective treatment for coronavirus quote the scientific data is really quite evident now about the lack of efficacy i basically do an amazing dr anthony fauci impression Also, really scary, terrible news. Uh, President Trump's white supremacist advisor, Stephen Miller's wife, is pregnant. That's right. There's going to be uh, another 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 terrible uh, person being raised in America by a white supremacist, Stephen Miller. I saw that today and wanted to mention it. Okay, lots more that I wanted to talk about, but check in with me. Let me know how you're doing. I've been hearing from a lot of listeners couple of which have uh, contracted the virus, but are doing okay. Shout out to Cindy and Megan, who, uh, who both contracted the virus, and uh, I'm, I'm worried about. And if others have as well, I know others have and have recovered, but, and I know we've lost, not necessarily a, a listener that I know, a subscriber uh, to the show, but we've, uh, we've all known probably at this point somebody who has died. 100,000 deaths as a result of this virus. And then there doesn't really seem, it feels like there's an end in sight. It feels like we're getting back to normal. But if you're watching the news, you'll see a lot of the countries that have tried to open back up have had resurgences of the virus. Uh, Specifically, I'm reading now in South Korea, and they did a really, really good job. So this is uh, no time to get in the pool and hang out with your friends or go to the casino. Or unfortunately for me, And a lot of my friends, a comedy club or a music venue or a sporting event, we're not there yet. We're a long way from it, that's for sure. But 
We're going to keep talking about it here on Stand Up. We're going to keep talking to all the experts on the show as well. I'm very happy to bring you Barksdale Hortenstein Jr. right now. This guy is a longtime listener of the show. I invited him to be a guest a couple of times. He is a public defender down in New Orleans, and he's the director of the Mental Health Unit, New Orleans Public Defenders. In this conversation that you're about to hear, I'm super proud of because this guy is a very passionate, smart, moral, thoughtful man and an expert on the issues that he deals with in terms of criminal justice. But I really let him talk and you got to listen to the final so 10 minutes or so of this interview is just about as moving and impactful of a moment or diatribe or monologue that anybody has made on this show. And I'm really, really proud that Barksdale has become a friend of mine and that we had this conversation. I'm psyched to be able to share it with you. I learned so much. You're about to learn a lot. It's pretty enraging, but it's great to know that a guy like Barksdale Hortenstein Jr. is out there fighting for the most vulnerable population in America, specifically in New Orleans. Great guy. Great conversation. Here it is. Okay. Here's what I want to ask you. All right. You were on 60 Minutes two years ago? Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was a little longer than that, but um, yeah, it was really cool. Current, current and former attorneys with New Orleans Public Defender's Office were interviewed by Anderson Cooper about deficient funding for the office for an episode of 60 Minutes that broadcast on CBS Sunday, April 16th, 2017. There we go. Nine current and former New Orleans public defenders told journalist Anderson Cooper that clients of theirs believed to be innocent were imprisoned because attorneys were too overworked to properly represent them. Can we start there? Is that a problem that you have? Oh, is that a problem that we have? Yeah, man, that is a problem. That was a problem when we did the 60 Minutes interview. That's been a recurring issue with public defense. It's a recurring issue in around the country with public defense. You know, right now we're in a what's called a restriction of services due to funding instability. And it's largely drawn from the fact that we're a user pay system in in Louisiana. So, you know, the vast majority of funding for our system comes through uh, the clients that we serve. So, you know, if a person pleads guilty to a crime, part of their guilty plea is a, a fine and a fee. And the court will have its fees. And among those, they'll include a a fee for the public defender. And so then when you pay your fees, your part of that fee is coming to us, which is, of course, very troubling because, note, it's when you are plead guilty, when you're found guilty that you get these fees assessed. Found not guilty, then obviously they're not assessing you any fees. So if our clients are found guilty, we get a fee. Uh, that goes to a, a big pot of money that gets sent over to us. Um, it's not a very big pot of money. It's a very small pot of money. Uh, but nonetheless, a pot of money that pays salaries. And if our client is found not guilty, uh, then we don't get that money. And so you can imagine that that might contribute to a client's already justifiable concern that his state-appointed attorney has a conflict of interest in their representation and is actually more interested in helping the system or helping the state than they are in helping the client. And that Jesus that creates an enormous roadblock to forming relationship. Is that a Louisiana specific thing? Is that common throughout the country? It, it happens throughout the country. It is uh, not, it's not as common. It's, it's particularly the level of reliance that we have, but I mean, very quickly we get outside of my pay grade level stuff and we get into, you know, talking to Derwin, our, our chief defender, and he can, you know, give you the better details on that kind All of right, stuff. So le- Let's stay in your pay grade. Right. You are a public defender. How many clients do you generally represent at one time? What is your day like? What's typical? So the, the, the typical day of a public defender is there is no such thing as a typical day for a public defender. <laughs> okay. I might have a day where I think that I'm going to do five hours of work in the office and an hour and a half at court. And I may never leave court before, you know, seven or eight at night and have to go straight home and never set foot in the office. That Those days happen. I may have days where I go into the office and I'm like, okay, we're going to knock out, you know, one case. And instead there's an emergency. I've got to go visit a client. He's an hour and a half away. So I'm now driving in my car an hour and a half away to go visit a client in a different uh, jail facility, different parish and meet with them. Uh, 
you know, parish in Louisiana County and everywhere else. Yep. And, uh, and, and then that's, you know, half a day, maybe my whole day. And so there is no, there's no consistent, this is your day. It's not a nine to five job. What is a typical, again, I guess that there isn't anything typical, uh, but case or client, what do you deal with most? You know, it, it just depends on where you are in your career as a public defender. Generally, when you start, you, you usually are getting cases that are uh, municipal city violations. That can be anything from public drunkenness to obstruction of a sidewalk or passageway. What's called aggressive panhandling because panhandling has been found to be an unconstitutional law. So they made it aggressive panhandling, which is basically just panhandling. Um, things like that to possession of marijuana, to possession of, now we get into felonies, possession of cocaine, uh, possession of, um, you know, scheduled drugs without a light, without a, uh, you're, you're currently dealing with clients that are arrested for p- possession of marijuana? No, I, I have a very strange position um, in the office because I am uh, the director of a mental health unit. And so I actually do an enormous amount of work with uh, municipal cases and the lowest level cases and simultaneously the most serious. I represent clients charged with the most serious offenses that our office has. So I have a very strange, as I said, none of this is typical. There is no typical, but average when you start as a public defender, you start on those lower level cases and then you, you know, start doing some like, you know, theft, burglary, stolen car kind of stuff, and then move into person crime. And we have a tier system in our office and you just progress through that. And it's like level one through level five and level one is, you know, city charges and possession of marijuana. Level to five be, is to be clear, pos- to be clear, to be clear, Possession of marijuana is is illegal in Louisiana. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And people are arrested for it. Arrested. Yeah. You can be given a summons, uh, you know, telling you to come to court to face your charge and the the marijuana can be confiscated. However, you know, it's it's fairly hit and miss as to an officer's discretion as to whether they choose to do that or not. And, you know, it's hard to say how consistently... They use that discretion to not arrest. We see, you know, a lot of uh, low level arrests, even during COVID, which has been very distressing. Wow. I have so much marijuana in my possession. Well, right now, that's not a great thing. If you were in Louisiana, like you would you would be in facing a lot of possible consequences for that. And uh, what a what a weird crime. Yeah. What a weird thing to make a crime. It's just so strange that I have. I have no problem with anybody having a ton of marijuana right, at all. Right. It doesn't, I don't understand. Anyway, well, I mean, so, in well, 2020. So people will say then, no, nah, I don't either. But, you know, I do have a problem with drug dealing. Like, that's wrong. But then if you don't have a problem with people having the marijuana and the government doesn't provide an avenue for you to legally obtain it, then market forces are going to necessitate that yeah. somebody fill that gap. So if you're okay with sure. people having marijuana or smoking marijuana, they're adults, they can make their own decision. Um, obviously talking about adults and not children, but you know, then it, you have to be okay with the fact that there's going to be a black market for that. And that, you know, with that comes necessary consequences that we know of and we've known of since well before, but certainly during prohibition, um, you know, when what a waste of resources. Oh, it's just, it's it's very it's very sad because it, it's also a waste of human life. You know, you have these cases where clients end up in jail and this is, doesn't happen uh, as much now because of some reforms that we were able to get through in the last couple of years. But, you know, we have a client. We had a client in jail doing a uh, I believe a 13 and a third year sentence where he had to serve the full extent of the time because he had had prior marijuana convictions um, and possibly a prior possession of cocaine. I don't recall exactly, but his conviction that he was doing 13 and a third years on was for possession of one, maybe two joints of marijuana. Oh my God. It's so crazy to me. It's just so terrible. I mean, I've got a garden filled with tomatoes and I just don't see it any and basil and, right. and, and, and spinach. I just don't see it any different at all that the, uh, another plant is, is cannabis. Let me ask you though, let, he, heighten the, uh, the stakes. Have you Barksdale defended rapists and murderers? Oh, definitely. I have represented people charged with, uh, the crime of, 
uh, first and second degree rape, which used to be called aggravated um, enforceable rape, which is what you're thinking of. And um, I've definitely uh, represented and continue to represent people charged with murder. Um, and I, I, I guess through luck of the draw, I don't know, uh, cause it's sort of a random assignment. I tend to have, um, people charged with murder. And now more recently due to the type of cases that I, like I said, I have a niche practice, uh, with the mental health unit in our office. Uh, I tend to have assignments that are murders rather than, uh, rapes. It's, it, it's just, how, how is that luck? <laughs> well, um, I, I guess the better way to say is uh, through the randomness rather than luck of the draw. But uh, either is is a very challenging thing. It's it's a very uh, difficult job. And one of the things that's most difficult for the public defender, and I'm speaking generally here, like you start as a young attorney, you're working way up, is the, the, the burnout rate and just how much work you sure. have to go through. You might have 100 cases. Uh, you know, you, if you're in misdemeanor court, municipal court, you could have, you know, four or 500 cases at a time. Um, if, if you, you know, they, they process 20,000 cases over there a year. Uh, we got four, maybe five attorneys handling those cases. Uh, you know, not, not all of them, but the vast, vast majority. We tend to handle about 85% of the arrests uh, and prosecutions in the city both in municipal and in, um, state court. And so, you know, that level of like just every day, all day, another file, more and more and more. And how can I do right by this person? How can I investigate? There's so many people that may well not have been guilty of the crime they're charged with, or there may have been violations. Like there was just a newspaper article over the weekend where some police officers were caught on body cam discussing, uh, the story they were going to make up to explain the justification for their stop when they knew that they had no justification for that stop. Um, wow. and, and so they're on video on their own video cameras discussing the fact that they're, uh, going to come up with this, this, uh, different version of events. And, you know, that kind of stuff, how many times does that slip past someone because they haven't had the opportunity to review 14, 16 hours of body cam footage from four or five different police officers who are on the scene. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that you ought to do in every single case. And it just can't be done when you have these kind of case numbers. So that is the type of burnout, but the type of burnout that kind of affects people in my level of practice isn't the number. Like I, I definitely have too many cases for the type of charge that I generally am representing someone on, but it's not the files or the, the number of people. It's, it's the emotional burnout, uh, at least for me. Uh, and you know, the trauma, uh, and secondary trauma that, that defines your, you know, daily practice. And it's, it, there's a lot of effort that has to be put in to try to, you know, understand what that is and to, you know, work on that and practice. How long have you been, how long have you been doing this? So I, I've been a public defender uh, since 2007, 2008, um, so almost 13 years. Um, and, you know, I tried, I was part of a murder trial in 2009 and uh, co-chair of a murder trial in 2012. So I've been doing murder cases since about 2012, 13, maybe. And How often do these uh, murder cases go to trial? It depends. In my uh, experience, it's very rare. You know, uh, cases in generally, in general, go to trial extremely rare. People have a, a widely held misconception that it's like it is on TV. And there's this big dramatic showdown over, you know, evidence in front of a jury. Uh, it's very rare that you have a trial. We have an enormous amount of trials compared to the nation's statistics. But on a typical year, it's about it's between 96 and 98 percent of all cases will resolve by plea negotiation. You know, we might dip down below that, but, you know, it's still it's going to be in the 90th percentile. So it's either a plea negotiation or a trial. It's usually a plea negotiation. Take me sure. through one. So you're charged with the crime. Please say you did something. Give me like give me this. The, give me the horror. Give me the horror. The murder was who, who was accused of what, right, what happened. So, um, there's a dead guy laying on the ground. A bunch of police respond. Shots have been fired. They get a bunch of 911 calls. They arrive on the scene. They find the dead body. Uh, they they try life-saving measures. It doesn't work. 
they uh, go to the hospital, not resuscitated, and you know they begin their investigation. They start talking to witnesses on the scene, try and find eyewitnesses. You know, sometimes they are met with cooperation. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're successful right away in developing a likely suspect or likely motive. Maybe the person who was involved in the shooting is still at the scene because they're explaining that this was in self-defense or because they didn't, uh, they were in a frame of mind where they didn't understand that what they did was wrong. So they just remained on the scene because they didn't have the thought that it was not something they should have done to stab or shoot this person. And you know, then the police begin the investigation and that investigation can go on for years or it can go on. I'm sorry, but how can someone not know that killing someone is wrong? Right. I mean, they're mentally uh, Ill. So, and maybe that's something that's a little bit more on the tip of my tongue than on the average person's because I, as the director of the mental health unit uh, and formerly the senior attorney for mental health litigation, my office, uh, I really only work in cases where clients have severe, mental, serious mental illness like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, you know, major psych, uh, depression with psychotic features and delusional disorders, things like that. Most mentally ill people are not violent, so, but it, but but you happen to deal with the ones who, the who overwhelming, often are. The overwhelming clear, majority right? of people with serious mental illness are not violent. Um, They're actually and victims. It's actually of crime, statistically right? much more common to be a victim of a crime than the perpetrator of a crime. Right. And sadly, a lot of that is. What you see in the case is that the person is a victim of a crime and then they react to that, uh, you know, and then or they, you know, once incarcerated on a charge, they have difficulty following rules because they don't understand the rules because their brain isn't capable of understanding the rules. Maybe because they have an intellectual deficit like an IQ of 54 or so, uh, and they just don't understand why they can't stand why well, they have to stand in this line and then there's a rule infraction and then there's an altercation between a guard who's not trained particularly well in my opinion in um working with people with serious mental illness or intellectual disability and you know you get these little violations that then become bigger and, and altercations between you know uh, deputies that lead to new charges and so you have this you know case i give you an example of my own a case i worked on recently where we had, I desperately wanted to go to trial. They, they had, it, it is the singular worst uh, evidence based case I've ever seen in 13 years. I had no worry at all that we would be convicted of the charge. They, they literally had uh, a single eyewitness say that they think they saw him from across the street at two in the morning walking by, walking near the woman who dies. Uh, Sometime in the next 48 hours that they that, that they can't tell when she died, but it's sometime in the next 48 hours and and that they believe that was the last time anyone had seen her with somebody. And that was the entirety of their case. She's found a mile away in circumstances that are not consistent with this, this statement. And a, another person confessed to the crime. There was physical evidence that another person had in their possession evidence of the crime, but they charged my client with it. And because of his mental disability over the course of many years, because he was going to the psychiatric hospital for stabilization and competency restoration. And so his case lasted eight years before we ever were facing the charges on their merits. And by the time we had, there'd been many new charges of fights with deputies, fights with other inmates, inmates picking on him and him lashing out, um, you know, possession of contraband, uh, like, you know, weapons to protect himself from physical assault that he was enduring. And there were so many of them so stacked up that it really didn't make sense to fight this charge that I'm fairly convinced he was innocent of. And I'm certain they couldn't prove he was guilty of, but he's going to do so much time on these charges that he's racked up over five, eight years trying to defend himself in an unsafe environment that, you know, Resolving the case to uh, resolving all of his cases in one swoop is uh, is better for his outcome. And and, he, <sighs> you know, he's going to rely on my advice because he is a very low functioning uh, person. And so then I'm sitting there having these discussions with him. And it's very hard and very hard to know what to do. Uh, the ethics in it are very challenging and muddled and no one wants to deal with that. And, you know, it's a hard 
Is it not a surprise that few attorneys uh, desire to get into this niche field that I've kind of carved out? How come you haven't burnt out? How come you keep going to work oh, and I, defending these people? I definitely have burnt out many times. Um, it's huh. sort of like, um, you know, learning to live with burnout as a part of life and finding ways to recognize it and try to treat it uh, and see it more as like, fighting the ocean, right? Uh, my chief of trials, who's a very close friend of mine, we started together uh, last of that class uh, from 2007. And he and I talk about, you know, this, and he gives a metaphor about the, you know, when you're in the ocean, um, cause you know, we're off the Gulf coast down here. You're, you're, so you go to Florida beaches and you get in the water, you know, you get hit by a wave, you get pulled down under, you, you you can fight it or you can just kind of go with the flow and just wait till you get back up and that wave will recess and you'll get back into a safe trough and then it'll come back up and then it'll go back down and that you have to view the workload that we have as similar that it's, you know, uh, it, it, you're going to have to absorb those cresting waves and know that there's going to be a time where, you're going to breathe again and then catch back up when you can. Is that metaphor accurate? Do you ever get time to breathe again? If you have hundreds of cases, how could you ever come up for air? So during that phase of your career, you, it, you really, it's, it's very hard to, uh, if not impossible. And, you know, sometimes we're able to take people out of assignment, you know, at the, I have hundreds of clients, but the vast majority of those clients, you know, don't occupy a significant amount of my time because I'm representing them on civil post adjudication. Let me make this simpler after they've been found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to the state hospital or were found, uh, too insane, uh, to be tried, um, in a court, then they may go to the state hospital sometimes for years, sometimes for decades. They, they may be seeking less restrictive settings. I represent them. So I go and visit them at the hospital and talk to them about their case. But that's a once a year hearing, maybe twice a year hearing. Whereas my clients who are facing active charges, you know, they're in jail. I, I visit them hopefully every couple of weeks and, you know, try to try to have a much closer relationship, but I only have, you know, five to 10 of those clients. And that's a reduced caseload for my level because of the other duties that I have. If I ever came down there, could you take me to jail with you? Oh uh, yeah. You know, we would probably have to, uh, that's something I have to throw by um, <laughs> our leadership team, but not but, that easy. Okay, we, well, we'll talk we about that, do that off the air. I mean, we can, we can not that it's it private. No, I just it's, wonder it's what the legality of that is. It's yeah, I want to tell that story. But uh, ha tell me about a murderer or a rapist that you've dealt with, because what I have learned in hosting the show and and thinking about criminal justice and is is everything is very complicated and nuanced it's not so simple and i'll never forget interviewing a guy who was convicted of murder and served i think 19 years and wrote a book and i was really so impressed and fascinated by his life and how he came to the place where he took somebody else's life and how he basically, if you, I don't know, maybe you don't like the word rehabilitate, maybe we should come up with a better one, but uh, became a much better person. And I just think that it's also very complicated as to what leads people to be in a situation where they would commit a violent crime and what the penalties are and whether they actually mean anything. So I have a lot of just you know, nuanced thoughts about it, but mine are very amateur. You are the expert on this. Tell me about your feelings on murderers and rapists that you've dealt with and maybe a specific case. Well, I don't represent murderers or rapists. You know, I represent human beings and people. You know, if, if you're a religious person, these are brothers and sisters of ours. And, you know, some of them have made very bad choices uh, and found themselves in very bad positions. And some have a great deal of responsibility that they need to address. And so that's sort of a big part of our uh, mission statement of justice, uh, dignity, and hope is that, you know, when I meet my client for the first time, it's almost invariably on the worst day of their life. And um, many of the days that follow are going to be tied for that. And I'm going to be standing next to them from that point until the finality of this matter is resolved. And 
you know, I try to avoid watching the nightly news because I don't want to hear what they're reporting uh, has happened. I want to meet my client as a human and understand them. And the system is built to dehumanize my client, to put him in an orange jumpsuit, to assign him a number, to call him defendant uh, and uh, inmate, um, and to use language that otherizes this person. But the truth is, if you do this work long enough, you realize that there's nothing other about my clients. My clients are just like me. They're just like my best friends. They're just like my mortal enemies in high school that, you you know, in the drama of your younger adult years, young adult years. And, you know, in case after case after case, it's there, but for the grace of God, like how in the world would I have not dealt with this the same way in so many of the, of the cases? Uh, and then in others, oh boy, <laughs> how do we get here? But once you start a relationship with a person and you learn their family and you learn their history, and uh, I just, it's, it's, it's hard to explain to people how, and I apologize, but just how wrong headed the idea is that we have in general, that there are murderers and there are rapists, you know, and that's that class of people. And then there's non-murderers and non-rapists. There are humans. Some of them have been given better education on how to restrain themselves, better education and uh, have access to better nutrition and better capacity to, to learn. They aren't suffering from fetal alcohol syndrome. They aren't uh, licking you know, walls with lead paint in them or breathing in asbestos when they're in their developmental stage. They're not prematurely born with hypoxia. They're not in special education groups that failed them. Uh, they're not graduating, quote unquote, high school, illiterate and unable to read, you know, so when, when the average, you know, person in society who's graduated from, you know, uh, high school, holds down a job, has graduated from uh, college, you know, or at least done some college, when they're looking around their peer group and they're saying, well, I would never be in that situation. Well, if you actually sit down and spend some time with a person, and realize just how absolutely human this all is. And there are certainly clients that have been more extreme versions where it's harder and the person has a serious mental uh, impairment and, you know, or the person has, uh, you know, a lot of responsibility on their hands for some, some very bad decisions and they're tough. But even with those clients, uh, over time, you, you develop a relationship and you understand who they are as people. And, and, and you try to create a relationship with them that they will see that you do care for them. And, and, and the sad truth is the number of clients that tell us that, you know, I mean, we'll have situation to situation where the resolution of the case has happened. He's accepted the plea. He's been sentenced, whatever. And the lawyer is, is crying and the, the, the client is, is consoling the lawyer. No, don't, it's okay. This is fine. I, I remember very distinctly a client of mine telling me, um, you know, as I was just gut wrenched, totally, I couldn't, I couldn't contain as I had to explain to him that he had to take a deal for eight years in prison where he'd have to serve those eight years flat and full because he had possessed cocaine and, and that there was no better deal and it was all on video and there was no way we could win. And he had these three prior crimes where he had possessed cocaine or, or marijuana. Two of them were marijuana. One was cocaine. And because of that, all in the course of 18 months, this 18 year old young man, you know, is now going to go spend eight years in prison. And I was just really, I was really fucked up over it. I had a hard time and I, I, and I was kind of falling apart in front of him, which is not the best (laughs) lawyering to do. Um, and, but he was genuinely like Barksdale, Barksdale, man, it's just a speed bump. And I just, the horror of that, the fact that in his mind, this is just a speed bump. He's just got to go do some time, just like, you know, everybody does. Because we've made this, <laughs> we've made this reality uh, where if you're from an economic 
uh, division of our, uh, of our caste system that we don't call that. Uh, if, if, if you're from a certain neighborhood, if your skin is a certain color, then you're going to go to jail and you're going to go to prison. Uh, so, you know, it's just a speed bump, just like, just like everybody. And, you know, we've done that because, uh, and there's been incredible scholarship on this, uh, from Donna Easy Coates to, uh, I mean, I don't even want to start. Like, there's just beautiful writing everywhere on this. Um, and any any study that is worth its salt will will reveal just another layer of the hypocrisy and all this. We have made money the driving force of the prison industry. And we've turned it in like a military complex. We've turned in the prison industrial complex and we get slave labor from people because it's not a violation of the 13th amendment prohibition against slavery uh, to enslave a person if they've been convicted of a felony. And so we do that and we pay them, you know, is, is what you're, is what you're saying too harsh? Is it, uh, is the word, enslavement too harsh for the work that they are doing, the labor they're doing in prison as a result of their conviction. I don't know, man. It's hard to say it's too harsh when the state penitentiary is Angola, a former slave plantation, and the that task they're often given is picking cotton. Like it, It's hard to, to say that I'm overstating that it is enslavement. It, but they're guilty of a crime, well, somebody were, would say. You know, this is not my feeling. No, I hear you. They, they, were, they were found guilty of a crime. But the, the challenge there is, what was that crime? When did it become a crime? Why is it that we're imprisoning so many people now? And that's my point. With the growth of this private prison industry, with the growth of the mm-hmm. expansion of the use of, you know, prisoner labor to uh, offset costs for, you know, everything from government construction to, to private businesses who can, who can make contractual obligation, contractual relationship with, uh, you know, state officials and, and get access to prisoners to do labor for them at, at reduced costs and save money. We, we made crimes so that we could have those people. We filled up those jails it, there's no other explanation for why it has ballooned from the 1970s to today, it, except that we've made everything we can think of illegal and we've done it in a targeted, directed way. And there's just too much evidence of that to, to honestly, faithfully come at this and not believe that's true. Let's get more into the system and the injustice in the system next time. This is a great place to start. Part one with our conversation with my friend Barksdale Hortenstein, Jr. of the Orleans Public Defender's Office, OPDLA.org. Dignity, justice, and hope is the slogan. You're a hero, buddy, and I'm so glad that we're friends. I appreciate you joining me. This is just the beginning. Great, man. Great. Uh, I'm looking forward to having some discussions on a range of topics. And and, uh, and I really want to, I told you this off air, but I really want to talk to uh, Professor Siegel about some of the frustrations I have when when people talk about what the law is and and it's I touched on earlier when I said that you know you see on on TV these trials but that's just not it's also you you read the Supreme Court and you go oh well, th- this is what the rule is <laughs> yeah what you're saying is with that point we've talked about this off the air the Supreme Court might make a decision uh, but it's not how it plays out in your court that you're <laughs> right. In. Right. And, and, and you're Eric Siegel, Barksdale <laughs> Hardenstein coming soon yeah, man. on stand. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope that you are as moved and educated, informed, enlightened as I was by that conversation with Barksdale. What a name. Barksdale Hardenstein Jr. Got to know him pretty well over the past few years. He's a longtime listener of the show and a subscriber and a great guy, the director of the mental health health unit at Orleans Public Defenders. And I'm going to keep learning from him and his colleagues down there in that office. If you are a lawyer or fighting for justice in your community as an activist, an educator, a policymaker, I'd love to hear from you. If you know somebody who is, I'd love to hear from them. Any person that can, can become a guest on this show if they're an articulate expert with credibility on a small range of issues or a wide range of issues. And one of those people is Barry Ritholtz. He didn't need this show to become that. He'd been doing a lot of media 
but he is a pretty big uh, media star in the world of finance because he, back way back in what 2009 when did he publish Bailout Nation? He also has a very popular blog in the world of finance called The Big Picture. Red Holtz Wealth is his firm. He's on Twitter at Red Holtz. He's got a huge following on social media. He writes a column for Bloomberg. He also hosts his own podcast called Masters in Business, which is really great. We had a great conversation about a wide range of issues on economics and finance and behavior. I think we might have done a little politics, but I'm not positive. I don't remember. Anyway, it's an almost hour long conversation. And we uh, we just did, did it today. I'm not sure yesterday. I'm not sure why. I don't remember. But I've got a lot going on in the old brain. And I'm sure you do, too. So sit back and listen. Do whatever you're doing. Tell me what you do when you listen to the show. You're going for a walk. Some people are in the garden driving, whatever it is, I'm so happy to be with you in your ear holes and happy that you are in mine. You're in my ear hole? Well, anyway, you can be. Let's talk. Here's my conversation with Barry Ritholtz. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Big Barry Ritholtz. You're not really big. I don't know why I say that in any way. I guess because you're bigger than me. Hi. That's a, that's a low bar. I've given you all the bona fides in the intro, five, by the five, way. 5'10", 5'12", with the hair, so I got it going on. All right. Lots to talk with you about. Very happy to have you here. And I want to start with the accusation that somebody made and copied me on it, that uh, the guy who wrote Bailout Nation is taking a bailout. Your firm apparently uh, took a government loan. And yes. uh, I can see how that looks bad in a tweet. Yeah, well, every twi- Twitter is not the ideal uh, <laughs> format to debate anything. New and it's a catchy accusation. The author yeah. of Bailout Nation took a bailout. So he got first you good. of all, we didn't take a bailout. We went to our bank, J.P. Morgan Chase. We borrowed money, which is guaranteed by the government. You know, people don't really understand. We manage $1.2 billion. That's not my money. That's not the firm's money. We work with over 1,000 families. It's their money. We are in the scheme of Wall Street and finance, a tiny firm, a billion dollars is relatively small. There are firms that manage hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars. Vanguard is coming up on six trillion, BlackRock on seven trillion. We are a rounding error, but but hold that aside. I bet you those assholes are fun at a cocktail party. My firm <laughs> manages six trillion <laughs> Some, some people are think. that way. That's Most what I hear. People, once you get to a few trillion dollars, you know, you just can be modest and let the let the T and trillion do it. Your speak, it's speaking for you. But um, in March, when the whole world was going to hell and no one had any idea what was going to happen, uh, our CFO came to us and said, "Hey, we qualify this program with our bank, J.P. Morgan. We could borrow two months of payroll to guarantee." Um, everybody gets paid. It's called the payroll protection plan. 90% of the revenue that comes into my firm goes out of salary. I have 16 client facing advisors and 16 administrative people, a CFO, a chief compliance officer, a quant, a videographer. We have all these different tech people work with us and uh, the people who manage as work with clients, they'll be fine. If the market gets cut in half, if people lose their jobs all over the country and start pulling money money out of their retirement accounts to live on. Well, the revenue of the firm would probably get cut in half, and those people's salaries would get cut, you know, also in half. But at a certain point, you you start losing the ability to make payroll. Um, when we launched the firm, we bootstrapped it. We didn't take outside money. We never borrowed money. We never used financing before, and so. I know what it's like to look at the end of the month and say, geez, we're going to be a little tight this quarter or this month, and we have to pull money out of your pocket to make sure you make payroll. That's when you're young and scrappy and just starting and a firm is new. Now you got 32 people. You're responsible for their payroll, their family, their rent, their food, their everything. If the choice was taking a loan or not, God damn it, I'm going to take that loan. And I don't know what's going to, you know, everybody's talking like the worst is behind us. Tell me what happens when the second wave of the virus right. comes back in November. Even if we don't do a lockdown, if everybody stays home, you're going to have the same situation. GDP drops minus 
I want to make sure I don't have to fire anybody. So you are a firm that has 32 employees. Yes. 90% of your revenue goes to salaries. And you took a loan out that you will pay back if uh, things don't, the bottom doesn't continue to fall out, which it, it very well might. But the idea is to keep all of your people on payroll without having to lay people off. You took out a loan That's and right. you're entitled to do that. And yeah. uh, I guess the, the question becomes, you know, when, when, does, when does a loan become a bailout, number one? And number two, I suppose morally somebody's going to say, well, there's only uh, there's an infinite amount of money that the government can loan out. And I don't think it should be loaning money out to financial firms that manage other people's wealth. I'm sure you have an argument against that. Well, that's someone's opinion if they want to go that way. Understand the second version of PPP is still pretty fully funded. There's over $150 billion left. They're probably oh, really? It, didn't program. the first one run out first quickly? One like that. Now, but here's what happened. Between the first one and the second one, the first one, everyone was freaked out. We thought we were all going to hell in a handbasket. By the time the second one was funded a few weeks later, things had stabilized a little bit. The sort of panic that we all have forgotten about already, our hindsight bias is, oh, I knew this would be okay. Nobody knew in the beginning of March that this was going to be okay. There was genuine fear that things were going to get really bad. You went into this to the stores in February and there was no toilet paper. There was no Purell. Right. There was no Clorox. People had freaked out completely and totally. And now it's late May and they've already forgotten what it was like when, oh my God, how am I going to be able to feed my family? It, it was frightening there for a while. So if you have an obligation to your employees, if you have an obligation to the clients you work with, of course, you're going to borrow money to make sure you can continue to meet those obligations. If you've never had to meet payroll, if you've never had to worry about, gee, the end of this month, we're not going to have enough money. Someone's not going to get paid. That's a big deal. And I have to tell you, I didn't realize until I saw some of the reaction, um, forget the bots and the trolls, but from legitimate people who raised the question on Twitter, you guys have a $1.2 billion. We don't have one point two billion dollars. <laughs> I wish we did. Our clients have a billion too. We get to charge uh, about seventy-five to eighty basis points on average on that over the course of the year. Um, we also have uh, a New York City office that's over thirty thousand dollars a month that's sitting there empty. We have lots and lots of obligations, and if the choice was taking a government-backed loan versus having to lay people off. That's a no brainer. That's an easy decision. Is there any is there any <clears throat> firm or or industry that you can see where it is egregious, where it is even offensive? Because I guess the idea it, it has to do with how much capital you have on hand and how many months you can make it through without a normal economy. I mean, what, what, whatever we call this economy, m making no money, having your doors right. closed. Like if you are a a chain, what I've seen, the analysis I've seen is that if you're a chain restaurant, a chain retailer then you'll probably you'll probably uh, survive. I mean, if you're not a department maybe, store, maybe not. Maybe, so maybe the, not. But but the, the only way. I found, the but a mom and I pops found. are not going to be able to. Mom and pops don't have cash on hand to pay right. two three months bills. So they, no matter what the business they're in, they are the ones who right. are most likely in, and entitled to take a loan. So so two big points about this. First, we didn't cause this pandemic. This is through no fault of our own. Bailout Nation was about companies that they themselves caused the crisis, paid themselves bonuses, and then took a bailout. That's great, a really different great situation. Great point. Great number point. Number one. And then number two, if you're a publicly traded company and you can have access to the capital markets, well, that's where you go get your financing. I can float some more shares and raise a million dollars like that. Um, but if you're a publicly traded company, there are people who are going right. to be willing to finance you um, probably at a, a reasonable discount to compensate for the risk they're taking, but you can tap the capital markets. That's what they exist for. You're a small startup firm. We're five years old with, or six years old with, uh, with 32 employees. You don't have that option. You say you didn't start the pandemic. You're not responsible for it, but I've been in your office many times. How do you explain those test tube beakers and flasks? What are all those chemicals in there? Right. What are you making in that office, by the way? We what do you want to tell? Little, 
Right. It's a it's a little breaking bad on the oh, side. Oh, you're just making it's a little, meth. It's a side. Oh, gig. you're just right. making and selling meth. Oh, that's not COVID nineteen. Not right. nearly as bad. Okay, so when we look at economics right now, and, and you're, you're a student of economics and finance, you're constantly, a, you're a student of psychology and behavior and consumer behavior and attitudes and politics and all of it. How are you looking at the science behind, well, how are you looking at epidemiology? How much are you studying public health experts? Because I'd imagine someone like yourself is learning as much as they can about this virus, which so many of us, the experts, still don't know about, so that you can predict what's going to happen in quarter three and four and next year. And so you can advise your clients, and so you can write and talk about it. Are you, at this point, Dr. Barry Ritholtz, epidemiologist, virologist? that's That's a terrible, terrible idea. Every time I'm watching TV and someone begins a answer to a question, I'm not an epidemiologist, but... You know, you should really just shut the fuck up at that point and you have nothing <laughs> to say afterwards. The armchair epidemiology is far more damaging than the guys just, you know, if the professionals, if the experts, if the medical community are talking about how challenging and difficult this virus is, who cares what some economist or portfolio manager or strategist has to say they don't they don't know anything by the way that ring uh light that was your light, light? It sounded like your, your keyboard doesn't jumped. really stick to the window as well as it uh, oh you had that a suction on a suction cup i never on knew. a suction cup yeah. oh that's smart because you're using the 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 natural light right now yeah. but later on you just Which keep you it. can see in my glasses yeah and the, the picture behind me where were so, you before you were so, so rudely interrupted by your suction cup failure yeah. so um you know, nobody cares, nor should anyone care what I have to say about the likelihood of the COVID-19 vaccine coming out in Q4 2020. I have no idea. And here's the thing. Nobody else has any idea, including many of the experts. This is really going to be a question of the reason we do the FDA testing is to find out What's effective, what's safe, and what can we produce rapidly and bring to the market? I have no expertise on that, and neither do 90% of the people you see on television talking about it. Right. Uh, you know, sometimes people ask you a question, and the right answer is, I have no idea. That's not my lane. That is and most such an that. understated opinion, and that's why I created this show. And people, by the way, thought you can't ha- you can't be the host of a of a media outlet that provides information, enlightenment, intelligence, and say, I don't know. But of course the, you can. But yes, exactly. And I and I succeeded for 14 years wildly and still <laughs> and still am. It's actually pretty cool now because the work-life balance, like, like there's a whole conversation and should be, and there has been being had for a long time, but about working from home. And I wonder what you think, uh, how the experience of working from home and adapting technology, because you, either you do or you die, will affect the new economy in terms of how it saves time and efficiency. There are some firms that are multinational, so they have people at the desk, you know, 24 right. hours a day during their eight hours and so on. And that's an interesting way, future of the economy for a multinational. You can get people to work for you in other countries. But Barry Riddles, how has working from home changed your firm and more importantly, the economy as a whole, if it has? So this is a question I can answer and happily will answer. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the answer in two parts. First, most people in finance, especially firms that launched after 9-11, um, the SEC promulgated a whole bunch of rules. And those rules say that, you know, uh, on September 11th, my office was headquartered on the 37th floor of Two World Trade. And I wasn't in that office that day. I was in the Long Island office. Uh, but it took us like three, two, three weeks to figure out if everybody made it out alive because nobody knew who was in the office that day. Nobody knew how to reach other people. Some people were on vacation. Some people, you know, moved and you just didn't know. So the rules changed. And now you have to have contingency plans for everything. You have to have uh, lists of who – you have to know where your employees are at all times, even if they're on vacation. You have to be able to respond to a disaster – quickly and responsibly. Uh, And because of that, when we launched the firm, I I said six years, September will be seven years. In 2013, September 2013, 
we launch completely in the cloud. We, we have no paper documents in the office. We have no filing cabinets. Everything is virtual, which means on March 8th, when I gave everybody in the office the opportunity to work from home, say, hey, this is optional. If you want to come in, great. If you want to work from home, just be responsive to your colleagues, employee, fellow employees, and clients, and, and make sure you're accessible by phone, email, and Slack. And And so- that lasted a week. And then by the 15th, a week later, it was like, all right, there's no reason for anyone to come into New York. This is getting much worse. So the New York office is closed. Everybody can work remotely. It was a seamless transition. It was very easy to do that. Uh, I think the city closed a week later and the state closed a week after that. So we got a two-week jump on lockdown. So, so that's the first part. The technology and those of us in finance who uh, remember September 11th, remember what happens, and have followed all the guidelines on to how to avoid those sort of uh, situations where data is lost, client information is lost, documents um, couldn't be found. That that part was the simple part. The second part, I think people are misunderstanding. I keep people, hearing people say, everything is different. This changes everything now. Well, first of all, we heard that after September 11th, and other than taking your shoes and belt off in the airport, I don't think everything changed. It took a few years, but things eventually. This is different than that, normal. though. This is different. Yes and no. And I mean, and the vast why. majority of the country this is the only argument I want to make that you would I would want to hear mm-hmm. your answer. I was reading something recently about 9-11 and the vast majority of Americans went back to normal. New Yorkers didn't for a while, but then we did. But we right. never had to adapt. Even New Yorkers didn't have to adapt to to much. You mentioned the some of the security things flying on the plane, whatever. Right. But now we've all had to adapt in so many ways that it's hard to measure how we might have found new things in life to search and enjoy and pursue and adapt to all of it. I, I feel like everything's a lot has to be different based so on let that. Me, let me the give whole you country the experience, it, not just New York I'm, and D.C. And, let me give you the subtle nuance right. on this because I think this is what people sure. get wrong. I'm on a Zoom call the other day with about 12 people. Quit bragging. Um, and uh, really interesting people, former Federal Reserve people, some Nobel laureates, this, that. Everybody is looking around. Here comes the dog letting himself in. Everybody is looking around at the technology and they're all talking about how everything is different. And now we do these Zoom calls and we do all these other things. And what I had said to Pete, this group was, none of this technology is new. What we're doing is accelerating what took pl- what was already an existing trend. And I'll give you three or four of these trends um, all together and tell you how they've changed over time. Um, so first, uh, video calls. That's that's been available since you had the first iPhone. Right. Over a dozen years ago. So so that's nothing new. Um, Zoom and Skype calls and any of the other video calls, all of that stuff has been around for years and years and years. And it's only recently that Zoom has blown up how, how, how commonplace it's become. But we have, you know, offices in 14 states. We regularly do a, a weekly call where people log in. This is pre pandemic where people logging in from California, from Portland, from Chicago, from Florida, from North Carolina. This is not from Louisiana. I could keep naming cities, but this is not the sort of thing that is brand new. This is accelerating the adaptation of this. Um, Work from home was something, uh, virtual offices and look, we work, which is dealing with its own mess. The reason we work became as popular as it did is that it allowed people to not have to go into an office with 100 people, that you could take a small office. You don't need a lot of space. You're, you're co-officing. You're sharing space with people. Um, there was a demand for that. They met it. They also messed up a whole bunch of other stuff. But that Regis predates we work for, by decades. That was a trend that existed long before this uh, pandemic happened. And let me give you three other little things. I wrote something, I want to say it was 07, I just was looking at it, about how wildly over-retailed America is. Um, It's something like 23 square feet of retail footage per capita, per person in America. Yeah, it's ugly. 
versus other countries that were like 11 and seven and five. Now we don't have 23 square feet per person of retail space anymore. That that's probably down about 30%. And I suspect that's going to end up dropping to eight, seven, six. What you mean by that is reasonable. brick and mortar stores, strip malls, mega malls, yeah. uh, big, yeah. big box stores. But keep in mind, Home Depot is doing great. And Walmart and Target are both doing great. And Amazon not only has Whole Foods, but they're now looking yeah, at because of the nature of what Penny. they're selling and that they're generalists or <sighs> yes they're selling no. things that are specially needed right now. I mean, if you're if you're a sure. specialty shop selling purses uh, or they even a chain online and you maybe you have a flagship little store somewhere in New York or Paris yeah. or or Los Angeles, but you're not going to have. A hundred shops all across the. But I think country. I interrupted you there with before you were finished with those with those points. Those seven, were you done? Because well, uh, go ahead. Well, I just feel like what you're pointing to. With my my question is, you know, how, what does this change, and how do we adapt? And you know, is there ever a new it's normal? And you're accelerating everything. It is bringing twenty thirty closer to us. Um, I made the argument that the colossal disaster of the financial crisis probably accelerated the first African-American president by a decade. You know, people were just so frustrated with the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and then the financial crisis. That whole um, Bush era brought Obama a decade early. And I think the quarantine, lockdown, pandemic, everything we're dealing with today is probably bringing forward the technologies of the late 2020s and early 2030s into broader adaptation um, by but aren't everybody. people just would happen eventually anyway? But aren't people just realizing managers and bosses and and bean counters how much more efficient a, a, a number of different jobs can be if people stay home? I guess the idea was if you don't come into work, no one's watching you. You're not going to do any work. You're whacking off the whole day and smoking weed. But the truth is, you if you you could whack off and smoke weed and be more efficient, have more of an output because you're home and you don't have a commute and you structure your day twenty minutes on, five minutes off, and so on. And those kinds of efficiencies are as a result of the of adaptations because of the pandemic. Does that not, in the aggregate, change the way that firms evaluate the work week, much less the work day? You're seeing what is it, New so, Zealand going to four days? I mean, I'm talking about those big macro right. changes that people. Are, are, might make as a result of having to adapt and having to get their their job done despite not having to go to work, being in an so, office. So here's, wearing here's khakis. why I don't fully buy into that, right? If you look at the growth around the world and in the United States over the past 10, 20, 30 years, the lure of the city has been undeniable. It's where all the economic activity and growth has been taking place. It's where a lot of innovation has been taking place. It's where lots of young people are attracted to, to living. Cities have been a dominant feature of human culture for, let's call it 500 years. Is that a fair, fair number? Okay. There's a reason for that, and that reason is simply intellectual capital. The gathering of... of of intelligence, of of human capital, of people, of ideas, of bringing different uh, sort of things together, that can only take place within a certain amount of density of of human capital. And it's not a coincidence that all the growth since the financial crisis, all the growth really of the 21st century and the late 20th century was driven in large part, not exclusively, but in large part, by cities, it's a very, very specific um, social and intellectual and economic construct. Uh, I, if if you read books like *Sapiens*, um, the author blames a whole lot of diseases on the density of cities, going back to the early days of agriculture. Uh, a lot of the things that we have take place because of. Um, because of agriculture, because of density of people around, people with farm animals, people with yeah. other things that cause disease. But look, it, it, it's not a coincidence that Hong Kong and San Francisco and London and New York are the most valuable real estate. Uh, uh, and I could probably reel off a dozen other cities, Singapore, go down the whole list. It's because the demand for that is there. Now, if you're going to tell me that 500 years of a trend has ended because of a pandemic, um, 
one that is likely to be treatable within a year and have a vaccine within two years. That's as far as my dabbling uh, as an armchair epidemiologist will go is making those guesses. And I'm just quoting other experts. I don't believe that. I think that the underlying basis for the rise of the city uh, is going to continue, especially once we have a way to manage this. And it might just be more affordable to live in. <clears throat> um, it's You always have to look at the ratio between income and costs. You know, everything is much more expensive in cities, but the salaries are higher also. You could go to far away from the cities where things are much cheaper. And at the same time, the salaries are going to be commensurately cheaper. So it's expensive to live in the city, but the comp is higher. And there's also a lot of fringe benefits. There's between all the things that we're not doing now, we're not going to stand up comedy. We're not going to theater. We're not going to dinner. We're not doing all these things. All the stuff that's not taking place because of the lockdown, I think everybody is going to have all this pent up demand. And once we're free to move about um, without fear of getting sick and dying, uh, that all that stuff is going to come roaring back. It existed for 500 years for a reason. You, on your, let's do it for another five minutes. Wow. Highly rated podcast. The big picture is your blog, redolts.com. Yes. And one of the questions that you ask and answer, which I think is interesting and important because I don't understand apparently how markets work, well, how the stock markets work, is how do you evaluate the, the value of a company when earnings have completely plummeted? That's right. And, and everybody keeps talking about how far this market has rallied off the lows and, oh, look, valuations are stretched. That's not how markets work. So, so first, you have to always look at things within broader context. March was one of the fastest collapses in market history. It was one of the 20 worst months of all time in the market. Mm. So when a market falls that fast, when the rubber band gets stretched that far, it's going to come snapping back. Eventually, the, the technical term is seller's exhaustion. Eventually, everybody who wants to sell has sold. When there's nobody left to sell that creates a vacuum in price over it, and stock assets come snapping back. We, we saw the same thing at the end of the first quarter of uh, 09. In, in early March, you basically had a 56% collapse over 18 months. And by the way, that was considered very fast. This most recent collapse was a 34% drop. Only it took... Uh, barely a month and change. It was, you fell more as much as you did in the great financial crisis in about 6% of the time. That That's a huge, huge collapse very, very quickly. Not a big surprise to see the market snapping back, number one. Number two, I can't put a valuation on the market when earnings are going to go to zero. We value markets as a multiple of different things, price to book ratio, time, revenue, Earnings, there are all sorts of different ways to value markets. But when you have a meteor hit the planet, it's not the normal cyclical recession where you could turn around and say, well, things got too expensive. And now given the decrease in you know, the, the great financial crisis or GDP drop 4%, uh, we probably are down 10 times that amount. We're probably down 40%. The Atlanta Federal Reserve does this... Um, survey called GDP Now, where they try and calculate a snapshot of what GDP is. As of last week, it was minus 40%. Yeah, you have that so, on the blog as well. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, a, it's an insane number. And so for the year, I'm not an economist. I'm going to guess we're down 8, 10, 12%, something like that for the calendar year 2020, uh, assuming there's some sort of recovery down the road. So, so based on all that, how do you value stocks when revenue is going to get cut 20, 30, 40% and profits go from the, the way we typically measure this, the S and P 500 uh, profits were ballparked at about $175 for the year. So when the S and P was about 3000, that was pretty pricey. That was do the math on that. That's, you know, about 18 to 20 times earnings. That's a little high. We like to see it around 15 times, but you know, sometimes the market is cheap. 
and no one wants to buy stocks then. And sometimes the market is pricey and everybody wants to, to buy stocks then. Not, not a coincidence. A lot of dollars chasing a limited number of stocks, they start to get more expensive. But you, you have to, and I think the stock market is doing this, you have to look over the valley uh, of zero earnings to the recovery on the other side. Whether that's six months or, or a year and a half, two years, markets are probabilistic mechanisms. They're discounting the future, and they're making a bet on what are possible outcomes. By the way, that could fork very easily. If suddenly it looks like there's not going to be a treatment anytime soon, if suddenly it looks like, hey, we're three years from a vaccination, um, you're going to see the markets start to roll over as they anticipated. Amazingly, the markets fell long before the economic data was terrible, and they began to recover long before the economic data improved. They're always discounting the um, probabilistic outcome in the future. They're not telling you what just happened. They're telling you what might happen three, six, 12 months down the road. You interviewed uh, Jonathan Daffler. Is that right? Yes. And uh, bar rescue. Uh, yeah, bar rescue guy. Uh, I was going to say, who is he and what did we learn? But w- tell me a little bit about what, you know, the experts in the restaurant business are predicting because that is an industry where, you know, I, certainly I, I've never met payroll for anything. I've learned very little uh, about restaurants except for the profit margins that they operate at are, are, are pretty thin, right? Generally right. speaking. And so they can't go a month without people coming in. They can't go a week without people coming in and, and sitting down. So what is, what is the prediction for the restaurant restaurant industry? So, so Taffer is a really interesting guy. He started his career at the Troubadour uh, where Lenny Bruce and George Carlin, as well as a ton of great musical acts uh, played. And um, he worked his way through the hospitality business, hotels, restaurants, bars. And when Gordon Ramsay came out with Kitchen Nightmares, when that first aired on television, Taffer said, hey, I know some people at Paramount. I think uh, rather than do a restaurant version of this, let's do a a, a nightclub and bar version of this. And um, he tells the story on the podcast. By the way, I thought he's the perfect guy to talk about bars and restaurants in the middle of a lockdown and, and what was going on. The other person I interviewed like you, I like to go to experts and get their opinion as opposed to me opining about things I don't know about. The other person I spoke to a few weeks ago was Pat LaFrida of LaFrida Meat Purveyors. He's the guy who supplies meat to most of the high-end steakhouses in Manhattan. He created the Shake Shack Burger. He's the steak guy for Peter Luger's. I mean, really well-known um, meat purveyor. LaFrida told me about half of his restaurants are not doing anything. The other half are doing curbside service. And the ones that are doing curbside service are, are running about 30% of what they were doing pre-crisis. And you so, can't, you can't really, I mean, it's very hard to continue operation at that, right. at that low percentage. And also uh, what I've learned from, who, who was it uh, talking to the Atlantic's uh, um, Derek Thompson about love Derek. Thompson. Yeah. He was just talking about how, you know, where the profits are in restaurants and they make, you know, so much of the their bar. money off of, the bar and desserts, yeah. where there's a lot of profit yeah. and, and making those products that they can, you know, but they're not delivering curbside right. desserts because right. they go bad quick often doesn't, and, doesn't and drinks well. like, right. That's right. So, so one of the things the New York city let the restaurants do was sell drinks to go during normal times. You're not allowed to do that. So that was kind of an interesting idea to kind of help these companies out. Uh, Jonathan Taffer, his concern is that given the low margins of these businesses, most of these companies um, are going to have a hard time staying in business. He thinks that in order to survive, the government should make um, loans available to these companies because if you want to reopen, the first thing you have to do is stock the bar and stock the fridge. Half the stuff you had in your fridge, I'm sorry, half the stuff in your bar and everything in your fridge has to be thrown out. So in order to restock, you're going to need a line of credit. And whether that happens on a state or federal level is unknown as of today. Uh, And he thinks that by the time we're all done with this, 40% of the existing bars and restaurants will not have made it. And that's a giant frightening number. You wrote a great piece cover story for Business Week a couple weeks ago uh, about how we need a moonshot. 
and I made fun of you at the time. You did. Because where I criticized the idea, because of course we do. It's a great piece, but it's a piece for a time when our government is completely different. Or it's or it's certainly a good idea for maybe a country like Germany or even Canada or, or in, China or uh, China. I wouldn't list as an example because all they have to do is beat the drum and, and everybody goes. So that's but, what but my point. That's my point important. was my point was that we can't come together to make masks, you know, w- this country is not going to have the ability to do a moonshot with President Joe Biden, much less President Trump. I mean, we, we the government can't do it. It has to be the private sector and they can't do it without the cooperation of government. And so I just don't see uh, us us doing what you are prescribing. And, and but the other point is, I've seen a lot of other people kind of write similar pieces since yours posted about what needs to be done. Yeah. It all makes economic sense. It's kind of obvious that we need to adapt and change and, 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 and think about the economy completely different and we're not going to do it. So, so let's talk about wealth. Let's talk about history. um, And let's talk about democracy. Just a couple of minor little issues we can discuss. (laughs) So, so, this country has been engaging in private public partnerships for, I don't know, 400 years. Uh, we aren't that country public- anymore. Right. Well, but we, there's no reason to think we can't be. We, we've we done there that is. very successfully. Now, since the 80s, we've moved away from that, and a couple of things have happened. First, we've had a regular series of uh, – financial panics and and crises. We've had the 87 crash, then we had the double dip recession in the early 90s, and then we had the long-term capital management blow up and the Asian contagion uh, with the Thai bot currency crisis, and then we had the dot-com crash, and then we had, go through the list, the, the housing crisis and the great financial crisis and the flash crash. It seems like we're having these 100-year floods every two or three years. Um, so So not only that, but over that same period, We've seen wealth disparity. What did you get? The same uh, beverage? Did Mm-mm. you go for the La Croix as I did? The passion fruit? Earlier, the, earlier uh, I was pan- drinking a Coors Light because I'd been out in the sun. Yeah. I won't drink before 530. That's how I manage. And my, now uh, I'm drinking, drinking. A, a La Croix. And I, my, La Croix. my rule has been the last week or so, I, I can have a drink after lunch and before dinner. Like one right. one well, beer, you getting... know, it creeps backwards, and eventually it's uh, scrambled oh. eggs and beer. Oh, no doubt. Make no mistake, I am slotty. The, <laughs> so the, that's why the, I use the, the rules, five thirty happy the hour. Rules are... So, but anyway, wealth disparity has been on the rise since we've stopped doing these big projects. You know, when you build the interstate highway system, you create a lot of good jobs for middle class families, and you create a platform that private sector can build on. And the same is true for NASA and, you know, the defense department, big government, big government projects and big government investments. No, private sector or uh, fine private sector investments correlating with, uh, you know, a a lack of, of wealth disparity or an increase in in wealth disparity without them is what you're saying. I'm not explaining it very well, but I would, I would argue as well, if not equally or more important, the demise of organized labor, being able to leverage, uh, and anything from wages to benefits that has played a huge part in wealth disparity. And if you're not going to some degree, but that predates the wealth disparity by a few, that goes back to world war two. When we came back from the war, you saw labor unions, you saw a couple of things change that were very significant. Um, more and more middle-class jobs were not union. were not labor um, jobs, organized labor jobs. And second women entered into the workforce in tremendous numbers in middle class jobs, previously they were nurses and teachers and secretaries pre war. After the war, that changed and it really accelerated in the 70s and 80s. And so some people have, have put a causal relationship on that. I'm not convinced. Um, I think the drop in labor unions has been something that was a long time coming pre this wealth disparity. You could lose. Um, union jobs, but not still have the massive income inequality and wage inequality we have. So so that's one issue that that's worth really thinking about without these private public partnerships. Um, 
the other issue what about is, democracy? Well, you know, November 3rd is the election. If people are happy with the status quo, then they could vote for a divided government. We've been doing that frequently over the past 50 years. We like divided government sometimes. If you think, no, no, this has gone too far in one direction and we want a unified government, almost a parliamentary election like they have in the UK, um, it wouldn't take much to flip the Senate uh, and to replace the president. Yeah, but our, and but, then if you want change, that's how you get change. That's a way too change, simple. That's, vote for divided government. Now that, that, I mean, ideally that would be the case, but I don't think that that's, that we have a healthy democracy to make that. No, we don't. We haven't had a healthy democracy for decades. Yeah, but you, you make it sound so simple. If you want change, just vote for change. And that the truth uh, is, it, I would like to, but, democracy. but it's not, we don't have a democracy. If you're a black person, it's going to be harder to vote or he's, you know, he's not allowing people to mail in votes. So it's, yes, my, he is. He could, he could tweet all he wants. He's lost every single lawsuit, every single case that's come up. You have to separate what is said publicly and what is actually there, done. I, I understand, the but there are going to be obstacles. And, vote, not the president. He's governors? just a blowhard about it. Yeah, look at what took place last election in Florida, in Wisconsin, Georgia. in Michigan, in, in a lot of places, in Georgia, well, for Yeah, sure. that's – well, you're making my point for me, that our democracy you is – Florida it, just lost a giant case about allowing right. felons who a, have repaid their debt to tax. society to vote. Right. Uh, Michigan is now a Democratic governor. It's 2020 Wisconsin, and a court just had to decide that a state, Florida, could not apply a poll tax. <laughs> that's right. That's in 2020. Right. Well, yeah, you know, it's the me, South. Let me sum that up in one word. Florida. The South. Right. Florida no, is, not Florida the, South. is the, Florida the South. is its own. When it the comes South to. South has its issues. When it Florida comes to racial issues animal. and Tallahassee and that state government is very conservative when it comes to religion yeah, and very yeah, influenced so, by. You know, I just you, you I throw know, them in some there. Some of us believe in democracy and some of us pay lip service to it as long as it doesn't get in our way of power. I believe in democracy. And I pointed out after the last election um, that more people stayed at home and didn't vote than voted for either Hillary or, right. or Donald. So if if the majority of people, if it was 60 million to 63 million to like 75 million who didn't vote, well, it's a democracy. If Americans are are of the opinion that their vote doesn't matter and it doesn't make a difference, then we will get more of the same. I, I'm not standing on a street corner with a sign saying the end is near. I'm saying it is within the control of the American people to say, we've had enough of this and we're going to vote for change. Or the American people could say, yeah, this has been a party for the past four years and I want another four years of this. That is how a democracy works. Yeah, we have the Electoral College and we have 50 very diverse states and it's not quite a parliamentary system where you can do a clean sweep and be able to enact your policy. It just means that whoever's elected has a tendency to gravitate towards the middle. There's a reason why Bernie Sanders is not the nominee of uh, the Democrats, why Elizabeth Warren couldn't gain any traction because the party that's on the left side of center wanted somebody pretty moderate to take on Donald Trump. This is, again, I'm not a political scientist, but this is pretty obvious stuff. If people want change, they have to get off the couch and go vote. And if they don't, I don't want to hear them complain that, oh, this is terrible. Well, you need more than amongst the bottom 10% of voter participation. There are other countries that have 75, 80, yeah. 85% Voter participation. We're at the bottom of that list. The country that effectively created the idea um, of a modern democracy. You know, democracy goes way back to the Roman Senate. So I'm not going to say we invade, invented democracy, but really in the modern era, it's the United States. And we have not talked our book. We have not done as a country what we're supposed to do as citizens and as voters. That's for sure. I have nothing to add to that. Wow. I rarely stun you. Into well, well said. Agreement. Well said. I mean, I just don't want to I don't want to be pessimistic about the moonshot. I don't want to be. I and I am generally an optimist about everything. I just it's hard for me to not be a realist looking at the political divide in this country and our inability to even agree on on what is real and what is true, which is why maybe you know, at the end here, we could talk a little bit about Dunning-Kruger and cognitive dissonance and 
all these ideas, these these behavioral ideas that you have looked in and studied and and taught me a lot about. Never thought I was going to learn that from the finance guy, but that's what you're you've always been very articulate and passionate about learning those things. So when you see, I'll give you a specific question: all these people not wearing masks and making up all kinds of reasons as to why they don't need to. You know, some of it is just a selfishness and and a, and a kind of stupid ignorance that they won't get it. But Stop right there. That's all you need to. The first rule of Dunning Kruger Club is that you don't know you're in Dunning Kruger Club. <laughs> you know, it's it's absolutely the case. People people engage in behavior um, because we all listen. I'll admit, I I live in my my little bubble. Um, you live in your little bubble. Our bubble is different than someone who lives in Indiana or Wyoming, or Mississippi, I make an effort to get outside of my bubble. I make an effort to read a lot of different people. And it's hilarious. On on every morning, I put out 10 reads each day, and it ranges everything from uh, occasionally um, – uh, from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times to, uh, God, there's so many different sources I tag. And my favorite thing in the world that happens is on the same day, I'll get two emails from a, two different people. One says, why are you linking to that right-wing tripe? And someone else says, why are you wasting our time with that left-wing garbage? And it's usually because interesting topic, author I really like, and a well-written piece and as long as it's somebody credible, as long as it's not from, you know, the f- extremes that are out there, um, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, there's a ton of extremists. I won't give you the false equivalency. There's a lot more on the far right than the far left, but occasionally there's some stuff on the far left that um, doesn't pass my sniff test, doesn't pass muster. I want to know what articulate, intelligent people with a good track record think about the things that are going on. Uh, that are topical and have done the heavy lifting, have done the research. And, you know, if you don't make an effort to get outside of your own bubble, you're going to be surprised by the events that happen because you'll be living in an artificial universe of your own creation. Cognitive dissonance is was created for that. Republicans are considering another tax cut to help juice the economy. To To the man whose only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So speaking of tools, what uh, what does the Federal Reserve have that they can use to do anything to juice the economy that has been absolutely devastated by a viral virus, a pandemic? Interesting question. No one's happy with my answer, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. It is not the role of the Federal Reserve to juice the economy. The Federal Reserve is to make sure is there to make sure the financial system is working that nothing gums up the credit market, nothing freezes up the ability for money to move the way it normally does um, from from banks to companies to individuals to the stores and and services they purchase. They're supposed to be there uh, as well as to encourage full employment and to keep uh, a lid on um, inflation, which is kind of a funny thing because we haven't seen inflation for – uh, since since the fi- last financial crisis, and I don't think we're going to see it any time in the foreseeable future. But it's not their job to stimulate the economy. It is the Congress's job. They're the ones with the power of the purse. They're the ones that could say, hey, you know, the gasoline tax has been the same it's been since 1993, and our bridges and roads are falling apart Let's fund the highway trust fund properly by raising the gas tax to 20. Now, especially that gasoline, I, I just tanked up for $2.69 yeah, it's nuts. for Amoco Ultimate, for premium gas. That is absolutely the cheapest I can remember. No one's going to notice an extra dime in their gasoline, and you'll get paved roads and bridges that aren't collapsing. You know, uh, LaGuardia is in the midst of a, a, a long overdue renovation. It's probably 20 years past due. And when it's done, no one will be happy. Uh, no, I've been watching this come along, and, and they're doing a great job. Okay. And I think people will be happy Good. with that. But at one point in time, the U.S. Uh, civilian aviation industry was the world leader. The airports, the right. the quality. Uh, why have we allowed China to leapfrog us? Here's the th- reason why we should be competitive with China and Germany. 
they are the economic competitors of our industry, of our businesses, of our employers. And if we allow them to do a better job giving their companies a platform to build upon, well, they're going to kick our ass in the global economy, which means less jobs for Americans, worse pay for Americans, less profits for companies. Across the board, we have ceded leadership to other countries. Germany is one, but China is the most notable. And that is a huge, huge strategic error. It's an error that has ramifications that will last decades. And as much as as I know you want to blame Donald Trump, he is merely the latest in a long series I would blame, of I blame I blame modern or as I call it, you probably don't late stage capitalism. I don't blame and I blame the media more than far before I blame Donald Trump. That's way too easy. And how dare you yeah, consider a, me such a hack? I mean, right. it's, no, I've got I far. I just, to, I just wanted to poke the bear and see if I could get a reaction. The bear, I, but... Thank you for calling me a bear. That was very koala. <laughs> All right. Let me, uh, do you have, were you finished on that point? Cause I have one more question. So, big, so the, just one the, more big you know, question. Go back to when you talk about political divisiveness, Yeah. Uh, you don't need, you don't need a, uh, political kumbaya to have a long-term strategic plan for the nation. It's part of our, our security. It's part of our national I understand defense. that you don't need a kumbaya, but you do need people to generally agree on the baseline of what a problem is. And on economics, much less any other issue, we don't morally agree, much less you know, by any other measure, agree on what the problem is in terms of wealth inequality and wage disparity and labor laws and environmental laws and so on. So I just I feel like it's not just that we have a matter of difference of opinion. You mentioned Germany and and China, 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 maybe Germany. that's a future country. Uh-huh. It, you know, Germany Chindia. has, you know, arguably more democracy in their parliament. And their elections are arguably more fair and more even more representative. But put, putting them aside, China chooses their winners they pick winners in america it's supposed to be markets that pick winners in china That's it's right. basically oh fidget spinners are is that what they're called remember those things yeah. they're going to be a big thing boom everybody go make them right now let's make them what they decide the future of energy solar panels we're, we're not going to argue about climate change we're just going to produce solar panels meanwhile we're still making legitimate arguments for coal Nobody's making legitimate arguments for coal. The president of the United States, the the Republican Congress and coal states. Right. The marketplace has voted. Coal has every year for the past 10 years been at a historic But how much further would we be uh, ahead? How much further would we be ahead? And and at this point, had we seeded seeded those markets because of our uh, of our horrible political divisiveness? Final question, Riddle. Maybe, maybe. How closely are you paying attention to commodities markets and how much have you been thinking about, reading about, learning about how broken and corrupt and immoral our corporate, industrial, agricultural and industrial food chain are? You could go back to the concrete jungle. This this is not new. Upton Sinclair and, and others wrote about this a century ago. But nothing ago. lays it more bare to this generation of Americans. You you know, then those are those are books and, and authors and thinkers from a, a time long gone. I mean, I wish everybody would read them and, and get the to the same root problem. It's the exact same problem is we have turned uh, the the process of getting food into an industrial um idea and it it's not the you have some counters some pushback to this farm to table and uh, locally grown things but you know this has been the industrialization of of the food supply has been in the works for a century we it's just been uh revealed and we've been reminded of it because the pandemic has shown us uh especially on the on the hog side of it how easy it is to transmit disease in these uh, in these facilities. Uh, Michael Pollan puts it in his most recent article at New York Review of books titled The Sickness in Our Food Supply. Mm-hmm. He says to the question, how did we end up here? That the story begins early in the Reagan administration when the Justice Department rewrote the rules of antitrust enforcement and said that if a proposed merger promised to lead to greater marketplace efficiency, the watchword, and wouldn't harmed the consumer, i.e. didn't raise prices, it would be approved. So it's the idea that 
marketplace efficiency is the only thing that's important and that, you know, the Reagan administration rewrote the rules on antitrust enforcement to allow there to be more, I guess, marketplace efficiency, but less, far less winners. So there is a... Well, there used to be uh, a lot of winners, farmers all over the country, and now with this, it's like three farms. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, th- so that whole concept of marketplace efficiency being a driving force comes uh, to some degree from Milton Friedman uh, in the legal field. It comes from a, a jurist, uh, Judge Posner, who used to backdoor that into his legal opinions. It, it, it's not in the Constitution. It's not in any legislation. He decided that um, efficiency is a good metric for evaluating whether or not legislation has overreached um, and it actually caught on in a lot of places. What's sort of fascinating is um, in the financial crisis, Posner kind of repudiated his own philosophy and said, mm-hmm. I, I was wrong. And, and capitalism, as you've described at late phase, um, will, will eat its young if left to its own devices. And you need a little bit of a guardrail. It can't just be market efficiency as a sole um, situation. But, you know, that's been called the Chicago School for a long time that – hey, we don't need an FDA, enough babies die, and the company will stop selling poison baby food. It's an extreme way to explain the position, and it also reveals how absurdist it is. Um, Capitalism gave us such things as child labor and slavery and unsafe working conditions and uh, all sorts of other issues, but it also gave us a genius of how to allocate resources uh, efficiently and, and how to make sure that the right goods reach the right market at the right time. And so what we've tried to do with the regulatory environment was limit the, oh God, that bird is just gorgeous. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm what fascinated. Do you got? What do you got? Uh, a yellow finch, just bright yellow oh, right, right outside my window. That's a very nice break. Um, I have a bunch of feeders outside. Oh, you do? So, that's very yeah. good. That's very good. Uh, the hummingbirds haven't come back this year. Mine, mine haven't done great. I haven't had ever had hummingbirds, but I, I a couple of years ago, I felt almost bad spending money. That my my bird feed budget seemed a little bit high, and I felt I remember feeling bad buying bird seed because I wasn't like sponsoring a, a hungry child. It were, felt, you, were you feeding? If, were you feeding the squirrels or were you feeding the? Well, birds? you always feed the squirrels, although my mom you has do your been, best not to. My you mom got a, a pointed steak uh, feeder. And a bird and a squirrel impaled himself right on that son of a bitch. Get out of here. Yeah, really? yeah. We've got video. But no, I just felt That's I'm like, I'm not even feeding. I'm not donating to a, a, a an organization that is feeding humans. Let yet I'm spending that. a feeding certain the amount birds of money and feeding. feeding humans are not mutually exclusive. You can do both. Is that right? Yeah, you're allowed to do both. You don't have to ah. say no. I can't donate to the local food bank because I I bought some bird seed. You're you're not limited that way. That's not at all what PetSmart says. I don't know what to tell you. you ah, you that's should, propaganda. Never ask the barber if you need a haircut because the answer is always, of course, sit right down. Even so, me? Yeah, that's right. Well, that beard could use a trim. All right, maybe I don't a, know. Maybe a little uh, a little coloring. Bring back a little of that dark. Uh, uh, no, nope, I like the it. silver. I like the silver beard. Yeah. You were saying something before the bird flew in. I don't remember. Me neither. Exactly. The listener knows. Yeah. And they're going to be <laughs> agonizing. They really wanted to hear you finish that point. But oh, I, don't even they, I used to get so much criticism for interrupting you, and it was always accurate, and it was always true, and I was always being impulsive. And now I interrupted myself. And in this case, I yeah, I still interrupt, and I'm I still suck at it. But in, in in this case, you interrupted yourself with nature, and that's fine with me. Because we were Can talking about mar- market efficiencies. Uh, that's right. So but. basically, uh, he <laughs> says slipping right back into the that mode. Uh, you know, we set up regulatory rules and, and supervision because we know that some people left to their own devices are going to not do the right thing. Not, not. Um, they're going to, they're going to have a thumb on the scale. They're going to, a gallon of gas will be 0.9. And when you buy a pound of rice, think about the inefficiency. If every time you bought something, you had to bring your own scale and say, let me make sure this pound of whatever is really a pound of flour. Um, so we, we rely on the, uh, regulations to keep the marketplace fair and efficient. Sometimes the pendulum swings too far one way or another. Barry Ritholtz at Ritholtz, the uh, Ritholtz Wealth Management, the big picture, bailout nation. Listen to his podcast 
on the Bloomberg Podcast Network, Masters in Business. Is this a new interview with Michael Lewis or is it a brand replay? New, just came out. Brand oh, new, just came out. Monday. Oh, I didn't really realize that. I His thought you podcast. Were... So he has, by the way, he does a season with like seven episodes, like once a year. Yes. So his first one was about referees. And it was so good. I listened to all of them. And the new one about coaches, he talks about the guy who changed his life, Coach Mm. Fitz, um, who was his baseball coach. And he tells an amazing story. They're in the championship. He's, He's like the second round pitcher. He's not the, the lead guy. And for whatever reason, the guy who was pitching, eight innings um, flawlessly. He has to come out um, one out man on first and third and coach Fitch calls uh, Fitz calls Lewis over. And he said, I'm kind of glad yeah, I, I'm not even going to try and tell the story because Mike does such a great job, but he gives him such a dose of confidence. He gives him such a boost he said it wasn't just a change of the game. It changed his entire life. So uh, strongly recommended. Um, we'll listen to your interview with stuff. him and we'll listen to Michael Lewis, the series, but listen to Barry Master He's in business and listen to his dogs. They want you to leave now. Uh, that just means we're getting a delivery from, Thank you. from Amazon, Target or Walmart that's, or Home Depot. That's who's probably out front. Thank you. All right, Barry Ritholtz and Barksdale Ordenstein Jr. Before I wrap it up, I want to head into the email bag. My email is standupwithpete at gmail.com. I read them all. I try to get back to as many as I can. Longtime listener and friends, uh, like so many have become, Steve R. uh, sends me an email almost every morning, brief, and usually a picture. I love it, of his art, of nature. He writes, King, the madness of King Trump. Please, oh, please cut off your Twitter to spite your face, Donald. May 100,000 souls haunt you with absentee ballots from the beyond. He also included a picture of his latest wax art sculptures. Love it, Steve. Keep it coming. Thank you very much. Who else emailed me? Randolph with another very nice email. He writes, thanks so very much again. Loved episode 113 with Essie Cup and Stephen Hassan. I always love your chats with brilliant women, particularly like your observations with S.E. With Cup on integrity. And I can't possibly thank you enough for the introduction to Steve Hassan. A lot of listeners love, love Steve Hassan on episode 113. He's a former cult member, now cult expert. He writes, Randolph does in the email, looking forward to listening over and over to this chat and then to part two. Like Steven, I just want to be healed from my years involved in cults. Randolph goes on to talk to me about how things change for him. Really fascinating guy. Randolph, thank you very much for checking in. Always appreciate it. He says, I so enjoy marveling with you. Randolph, you're the best. Also wished uh, Julia, checking on Julia. A lot of listeners checking on my daughter, Julia. He said, one of my daughters broke a wrist, mostly because of my stupidity. We both healed. ERs are interesting places, expensive, but highly effective places to marvel at the depth of our connections with family. Good job, Dad. Thanks, Randolph. I appreciate it. Yes, Julia is okay. She had a follow-up on the arm. There might be a fracture. There might not, but I think she kind of likes it. Uh, The worst part is navigating our health insurance. Why buy health insurance and not have it cover, not have any doctors participate in it? That's currently our situation. When you go out in the individual market, uh, which is what I had to do after the SiriusXM gig ended, uh, well, let's talk about it another time. This is going to put me in a bad mood. Just a ridiculous, immoral system we have in the United States of America. Lewis emailed me and said, Dear Pete, trying to fast forward through all the personal stories with Eric Siegel. It appears impossible to do on the Patreon app. I don't have two hours to listen. Can you tell me how to fast forward on the app? Lou, just listen to the podcast on any other number of podcasts, and you can listen in double time. You can fast forward easily. And... A few listeners have suggested that I time code interviews. And so starting today, I'm going to write in the show notes to make it easier for people to select the things they want to listen to what time the guest conversation begins. So if I have three or four guests, you know where they all are. My idea of going live on the podcast and doing it every day and doing several guests a day, although last few have been one or two is to give you a variety of different conversations, ideas, issues, subjects, and people to listen to. And that way, hopefully, you'll always find something every day and you'll want to keep coming back here. So hopefully the consistency and the quality of the guests is what you look forward to and hopefully what you're supporting me with a paid subscription for. So check out the paid subscription link on 
the show notes and uh, join me here and almost 600 other subscribers. Uh, and finally, Barbara, Barbara G, who is a nurse, writes, Pete, please let me know if uh, you received this and you're unable to respond. No, I got it. I got it, Barbara. I'm getting them. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. She says, my husband and I are watching the miniseries Grant. During the show, I was thinking about the number of lives lost during the Civil War. In one battle, the Union lost 25,000 soldiers. I started to think about the war that is occurring now, the one at home against COVID, and I wondered if people partying at that Ozark Lake would pay attention if they saw satellite pictures of graves in the paper or on the news. The New York Times this weekend carried the names of many thousands of people that have died from COVID-19. Would it be more impactful if the graves were pictured? I searched on Twitter to see if anyone talking about the number of graves and what a 100,000 graves looks like. Several weeks ago, we saw satellite pictures in Iran or mass graves. I believe the same has occurred here. Juxtapose Iran and then New Jersey. Would people pay attention and think twice about their behavior? I doubt it. Just pondering. And I responded to Barbara by saying, Barbara, I got your email. Here's what I think is the most important question. Do we care when people who don't look like us suffer and die? Do we care if people we don't know or live far away from us suffer or die? It's mostly older folks or people of color or those living in poverty that have to go to work where they often get sick. Younger, wider, more affluent and healthy, they're the ones who jump in the pool with thousands of others, which, by the way, is gross even without a pandemic. Let me know what you think, Barbara. Let me know what you think, anyone who is listening right now. Thanks for listening to the end, and thank you for your support. Tell your friends about it. Lots more to come this week here on Stand Up. Doing the show daily, loving doing it. Really appreciate your support. I love you. You're not alone. We're all struggling. Let's support each other. I'll talk to you tomorrow.